now. Oh, okay. And now we're recording. So you can. Okay. Ahead. All right. So attendees, let's see who they are. Okay. Okay. Great. Panelists. Okay. So um, today is the 21st of July, 2022. It is 6.30 p.m. And I'm calling the meeting of TSO uh, to order. It's a virtual meeting, can be, will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so we have several orders of business and um, we have suggested timings. Um, I want to strongly urge that we be finished by um, eight o'clock at the latest. I believe that's when we're supposed to be finished, finished because uh, I wanna hear the hearings tonight in real time. Can we quickly so, confirm that everyone can hear and be heard? Okay, um, can you, oh, let me call you. So Anna, how are you? Can you hear us? I'm doing great, Dorothy, and I can hear you. Thank you. Good, okay. Andy, how about you? I'm fine if you're fine with hearing me. Yes, we hear you well. And Paul, how about you? I'm here and can hear everybody. Great. Okay. And Athena, I see your new picture. So it's so lifelike. I think it's you, but it isn't. Can you hear us? <laughs> yes, I, I can hear you. Thank you, Dorothy. Good. Okay. So here we are. And we have down um, a suggested timing of 20 minutes on uh, parking regulations, Lincoln Avenue between Amity and McClellan. And we'll hear the TAC report and we'll discuss about the public hearing. Um, and we have 60 minutes of water regulations and water bylaw. Um, and I, we have, I know Anna is here who is leading this discussion and it's it. I don't know whether uh, DPW Superintendent Guilford Morin will be here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's Paul. Great. And Shalini, um, who we hope will uh, be able to make it, wants to have us talk a little bit in more detail about her proposal for engagement and outreach. Um, and we have the, some three different committees of appointments from the town manager and approval of minutes. So let us go forward with the parking regulations on Lincoln Avenue. And um, let me see, in fact, uh, well, okay. Um, I know that we were supposed to read the TAC report and I believe TAC is meeting at this exact time on their safe, safe school streets issue. I don't know how much overlap there is on the meeting. So I'm not quite sure how to proceed on that. Um, we're, like, we're, okay. like oh, here Tracy yeah. is, great, woman of the hour. Okay. Um, so um, since we requested um, the TAC report and Tracy has provided one and Athena has put it in our packets, um, shall we proceed with um, Tracy presenting some ideas or have people had a chance to read it? I want to start with questions. Oh, hi, Shalini. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. Okay. Glad you're here. Um, so order of procedure, should we have Tracy speak first on this or would um, people having read the TAC report want to start in with questions or comments? If Tracy wants to give like a 30 second overview, that might be really helpful. Okay. Tracy, if, that's, if that's something you're interested in. Sure, okay. I can try to do that. Okay, so I, I was just at, TAC, at a TAC meeting. Um, we just ended so we could come over here. Guilford was there too. So okay. um, just gonna switch gears on that. So um, um, so I did send you a, what is it? A four page memo sort of summarizing yep. our recommendations. Um, the key recommendations are on the first page and then I go into why we're recommending those things. So we are recommending prohibiting parking on the east side of Lincoln between McClellan and Amity, you know, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. That was the key recommendation that was in the town's report that was done in March, February and March, 2020. And they cited a number of good reasons for that, um, getting input from the DPW and the police chief and the fire chief about why that's important. Um, and I know the Guilford Morian has said at previous meetings, right, that it's impossible to have, it's not safe to have two full lanes of traffic um, and parking 
you know, simultaneously on the road. Um, because so much of the parking there is related to the UMass commuting traffic, we don't see an issue of allowing parking at other times on the one side of the street. And also just, we had related comments, just there's been questions about, um, you know, overflow parking, like people who have been parking, where would they go? And so an unintended consequences on other neighborhood streets. In that vein, we do suggest um, limiting parking, prohibiting parking on one side of Sunset from Elm to Amity, because currently it's completely unrestricted there. And relatedly, we recommend prohibiting parking on one side of Elm. Elm is just a tiny street. Um, both Sunset and Elm do have driveways for each of the houses there. Um, this is just preemptively because if parking demand gets pushed to those streets, particularly Sunset, I mean, I know for me, as somebody who commutes to UMass regularly, I usually walk, or, but I'm often on Sunset, I'm not on Lincoln, because as a pedestrian, it's easy to get through. Um, and even on Lincoln, right, we also pointed out that Lincoln is not actually, Lincoln is closed at Mass Ave right now while the construction is underway, but cars can still travel north on Lincoln right to the university, because even though north of Fearing, Lincoln is blocked off, you just take North Hadley Road and then you end up on Mass Ave too. So it's not really restricting your access to Mass Ave. And when I've been on Lincoln, I still see quite a lot of traffic. Um, and then we just recommend too that, you know, once the dorms are open, which is planned for the fall 2023, that the parking restrictions be revisited. Um, just because we're not really sure, you know, what that's gonna look like. It is like a major housing development on the edge of this neighborhood with over 800 beds and not that much on-site parking. Um, the presentation I had seen previously from UMass was that they usually estimate that um, to have half, uh, you know, 0.5 parking spaces per bed is the general demand. I don't think they've adjusted that since COVID. And so with over 800 beds, that's over 400 spaces, only 100 of them will be on site and then the other students will be asked to park elsewhere. So we're not sure what that looks like. And so I would recommend that, you know, the town plan to re-examine that and see what's happening there. So that's in a nutshell. Thanks. Okay, Anna. First off, thank you. This report was really thorough um, and, and helpful. So I, I, I do appreciate your work and tax work on this. Um, I think one of the things that's still constantly pinging for me is, sorry, my dog is very uh, present in my life right now. Um, please go. Uh, one of the things that's been was pinging for me when this was first introduced was the were the concerns about safety, and so I hear what you're saying as revisit three to six months after those new the new halls are complete. Um, in your opinion, if fo if you you've got so many more folks there and we're only restricting parking until five p.m., aren't we? Don't you anticipate? Do you do you anticipate mm -hmm. seeing more overnight parking on Lincoln? Um, I'm really concerned about this as uh, as it was presented from a safety perspective, right? And so I don't want people's driveways getting blocked um, after five if for some reason there are, you know, more cars or there for whatever reason, there's nothing preventing people from parking in really close to driveways and blocking sight lines or blocking ambulances. So do you, I, I'm worried about the three to six months, that's all. Um, yeah, I mean, know, I think that the... I think the town could move up the time frame if it wants. Um, I see this, I mean, and I also heard from some residents of Sunset about this recommendation and they're saying, why are you, we do support having it on one side of the street, which right now Sunset um, south of McClellan doesn't have any, or is it Elm, sorry, Sunset south of Elm doesn't have any restrictions. But they say, why aren't you going to restrict parking on the other side too, at least like eight to five or something? I mean, it's all, I mean, we just took an incremental approach, right? The sunset on parking hasn't been an issue yet. I don't see a need to provide on street parking supply on both sides of sunset. I do think that that could be problematic, just like it is on Lincoln. Um, I mean, you can, the TSO can be more aggressive in its recommendations. I mean, I think just based on the experience that happened previously and the, you know, the, a lot of the pushback from the town's recommendations that were made on a safety standpoint, it seemed incrementally, you can take this step and then you can take another step. 
mm -hmm. um, to do more. And um, we did hear from before the TAC made its recommendation, Guilford Morin was at that meeting and we did talk about what can be done when there are cars up to the, um, like parked right up to the driveways or even bark blocking the driveways. Mm -hmm. And I know that TAC, that was a big thing when we were looking right next to Kendrick Park at the North Pleasant Street there is because I've observed cars actually like in the driveway space. <laughs> Right. And so the sight lines there are terrible on the west side of North, that section of North Pleasant Street. Um, there's really not that much that the police will do unless you unless, you know, it's marked. You can mark the curb, but then you can't you have to repaint the curb constantly and you don't see that during the snow. Mm -hmm. Also, they did, Guilford did say that. The police will enforce it if you have signs put up and you could put up signs at each driveway mandating you know that you're not allowed to park like near the driveways um i think um i my notes on that i think it was about like 30 signs or something that he would need to put in on lincoln to do that so that would be like another option to keep those clear it just seemed to me like a lot of signs <laughs> mm -hmm. and have to do yeah how many um, times we to clarify that parking is prohibited only from eight to five i don't know what the standards on that are i know that um and maybe guilford who's here can speak to that i know when i was um, visiting some of the other neighborhoods like i went all around the neighborhoods off of north pleasant street north of the north umass roundabout um just to see, and some of the streets only had like a few signs. I don't know if some of the signs have gotten hit or removed over time, but some cases it would only be like one sign per block or something. And so I can see where it would be possible that a visitor or somebody not familiar might not realize <laughs> if they weren't parked right in front of that sign or something. So I'm not sure what the standards are on that, but Guilford could maybe answer that. Well, I wanted to follow up on that. When you said you wanted to revisit uh, the parking after the dorm is open. Was that because of fearing what Anna has talked about, which there would be more overnight parking, or whether was it just a general thought of following up? I was mean, I think it's a general thought of just how much how much traffic is happening and how you know how much is an issue with the parking. I mean, from a safety perspective, there's no issue with overnight parking unless the overnight parkers are blocking the driveways. Right. Right. And so I just it's hard to anticipate, you know, in a space that doesn't have that level of parking demand now, like how committed people will be to like jamming cars in there. I don't know. So okay. um, Andy. Uh, so I have several questions um, and I don't know which order to take them in. As far as the signs were concerned at the t at the TAC meeting and uh, uh, by the way, I apologize that I was unable to attend tonight's TAC meeting. As, uh, oh, it, it was just a, um, no, it was just a subcommittee meeting about safe yeah, versus um, Andy. I don't, I'm not even sure we sent you out the information. Yeah, so I'm not fine. sure I had one either. Thank but anyway, yeah. and anyway, um, at the TAC meeting where we were discussing, where you were discussing Lincoln, um, I did make the suggestion, and it was sort of half suggestion, half question as to whether the police would find it sufficient to justify ticketing if there was a sign at each intersection for people coming into the street that says uh, no parking within whatever number of feet of driveways and whether that would give them reason to um, ticket without having to have uh, signs at every driveway and uh, I made that, I asked that question, of course, there was nobody to respond to it, and it was your meeting. Uh, I didn't hear any follow-up discussion on it, but I did want to kind of repeat it for mm -hmm. today's meeting, because I, um, if the police indicate that that is sufficient notice, and uh, Guilford agree, then it is another option for addressing the uh, problem you know because the question was that the police would not um ticket if there was no indication of illegality of the parking and that that was what the 
issue us. So that was that's one topic that but I Andy, had. Andy, on that one, I'll follow up with the chief on that and get back to the committee so you can clarity on that enforcement thing, that driveway thing. That's, okay. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, okay. and I, I just have a quick comment on that one is it just seems like I know in my neighborhood that sometimes people park close to driveways too. It seems that you should could sort of be opening some new standard where like every, you know, residential street could say we'd like to have a sign saying nobody can park near driveways. I just, um, but I mean, it's an interesting idea. And also, I guess, too, you know, in terms of the enforcement perspective about like how many signs would there need to be? Like what's considered like the entrance to the, the neighborhood, the exit, you know, what if you're somewhere in the middle, like, I, I don't know how many of those signs are needed, but I can also see that other neighborhoods might request similar signs. But of so. course, if we were going to uh, ask for signs on every driveway, you'd have that number of signs a very constricted space and it would be unsightly and uh, you could uh, for the same expense spread the signs to more because it's really a reasonable request for any street to make yeah. that uh, residents should be able to get in and out of their uh, property um, unimpeded and that emergency vehicles can service the property. Um, as far as Anna's point about uh, the effect of what's going to happen going forward. I do want to point out that we do have the experience already. The university owns the meters on Fearing Street across from Southwest, but we know that um, Southwest residents who have parking permits elsewhere do fill those spaces on weekends and um, at other times at nights and other times when parking is not being enforced by the university um, at metered spaces. So um, there is some experience that um, I think supports honest concern. And so I wanted to point out the Fearing Street uh, ex uh, experience that we've had. Um, the um, Another thing that I was uh, thinking about was that uh, there was some discussion, and I think you, it even came up briefly during the TAC discussion about um, having um, an exception to the parking restrictions, not just in the evenings, but during the summer months. And we had talked about that previously within the committee too, that residents met, might wish an exception during the summer months because then they can have social events at their houses and um, have guests uh, park there during the during the day if uh, there's a reason to. Um, I would, of course, want to hear from residents about that issue when we have public hearing, but um, I was curious why TAC didn't um, follow that mm -hmm. discussion and uh, if there was reasoning behind it. And the last thing is really for Guilford and that is whether um, there have been any actual traffic counts since um, Lincoln was closed off or if we're dealing it based upon observations. So those are my four things. Okay. Um Tracy, can we ask Guilford to answer that last question before I call on you? Sure. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, so no, so we've done no traffic count since they closed the road. Answer is no. Okay. And so then, um, Guilford, do you want to say anything at this point before I turn it to Tracy? No. No. Okay. Guilford, so, you, you still think it's an arterial road. It was traffic didn't go down enough that you would change the clarity, the classification of the roadway. No, we wouldn't change it. I believe it's a collector street, not an arterial. Like yeah, you're right, collector, but thank you for the correction. And thank you, Guilford. But I guess too, I mean, one thing is, you know, the memo from the DPW about how much space is needed for travel lanes and for parking. You know, based on road classification, it does talk about like based on the levels of traffic, and it it is worth noting as I do in the memo that in our TAC memo that um, 
you know, that the traffic volumes do change a lot, you know, in the summer and not in the summer. So, um, I mean, we could, Andy, we could have proposed something where it's only for the school year. I don't know. I have mainly seen that enacted in Amherst in terms of the residential, like the parking permits, like the downtown parking permits. Um, the other streets near the university that are marked and say no parking eight to five, they have it year round too. I didn't really know if that's an option to say no parking, you know, eight to five only during the school year because we haven't done that elsewhere. Um, I would say too that just with those new dorms that there's like 600 something undergrad beds and 200 plus grad student beds and that I mean grad students are more likely to stay on campus during the summer than the undergrads like a lot of undergrads completely clear out of town. Whereas grad students are still employed at the university during the summer they're still doing work I mean some go get internships but many do stay on campus and so I can see there continuing to be parking demand from them um, in the summer. I, I would like to ask clarification here. The original proposal, um, I thought it was during the academic months. Was it not the original proposal or was it year round? Yeah, I was just actually going to say that the last TSO from the prior council recommended that it not be applicable in the summer months. And uh, the decision, which was then um, rejected on a tie vote, that was not discussed at the council level. The reasons the council uh, changed, didn't go along with the prior TSO recommendation was um, other reasons. Yeah. So we were, um, we as a TSO right. were prepared to do that um, except, exception. Um, I think it is a, um, possibly something that this TSO can revisit as a separate issue, which is why I was suggesting it might be worth hearing from uh, residents and others who comment during a public hearing to help us uh, make an, what is an appropriate decision. I don't think we have to decide that tonight. Okay. Um, comment that has come in past meetings has been basically that there hasn't been a big traffic problem on Lincoln during the summer. But um, Tracy is bringing up the issue that with the new dorm uh, and the 200 some odd graduate student beds that might change. So um, Tracy, you still have your hand up. Yeah, no, and I just wanted to just, you know, comment on the traffic counts too. So, I mean, I know there have been historic traffic counts on the road. Um, and historic speed studies, right? The speed conditions seem like they've improved somewhat since the speed tables were put in, which is true also on other neighborhoods, including on Blue Hills Road. You know, that's definitely cut down on the speeds on our street. Um, but the traffic volumes really haven't changed that much. And and I still do see, like through the summer, anecdotally, I do see a lot of traffic still on Lincoln. And just that, again, it's not really closed because you can still take North Hadley Road. So you're not really obstructed getting to the university if you go north on Lincoln. Um, also, just just I noticed that with those traffic counts, the when um, in that March 2020 memo from the town, that those traffic counts were done the week before UMass completely shut down over COVID in 2020. So I don't know if we were already seeing some effects because you know, every day that week, there were new things coming out from the university is like, we're monitoring the situation, we're starting to restrict travel, we're starting to restrict and like just, you know, less than a week after those were completed, the university said, we're not having, you know, in-person classes. <laughs> so, you know, already I kind of, I don't, my recollection of that time is a little fuzzy, but I do sort of remembering things starting to sort of ramp up and people already starting to be like, well, I'm gonna be a little more remote because this is starting to happen, so. Um, so we don't know if we were seeing that effect already. I think that's an interesting point. Um, I'm going to talk about time for a second. Um, I know that before we can call a hearing, which we're going to do in the fall, we would have to have a very clear charge. Uh, we don't have a motion on the table now, though, if somebody wants to make a motion uh, with such a charge, we could do that now, or we could say we would do that for the next meeting. What are your thoughts? Paul. 
Yeah, I was just going to mention that you are over budget for this time I, for this item. So I think if you, I, it would be wise, maybe you take the uh, tax recommendation, say that's what we're going to put in the public notice. And that gives us time to get the public notice. I know you don't want to schedule it until after Labor Day when the students right. are back, but it gives us time to get that notice prepared, have you review it. Um, and if, but if you could decide what you want to put in that notice, that would be very valuable for tonight. Okay, so I guess um, I would say I would entertain a motion that we accept tax recommendation um, as our proposal for the public hearing, knowing that after we have the public hearing, we then make our determination of what our position is. Um, do I have anyone who will make such a motion? There is, sorry, uh, I'm, I, I'm happy to, oh, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy for you to make the motion on uh, the only um, question I had is, is if we have any uh, open issues that we want to talk about, for example, the issue about applicability um, during the summer months or uh, the um, question of uh, signs, which Paul is going to get us information on which to consider a subsequent meeting um, uh, about driveway restrictions, uh, whether we would need to uh, have clarity on that before we can actually do posting. Yeah, the council doesn't designate where signs go. The council doesn't, you know, does those kind of implementation things would be done by Guilford. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to get to that level of detail. You, you can decide what you want to see happen. And also, but the important thing is whether you want it during the academic year or year round. But I think that's something that you can either include it in the notice or not. It gives you know, mm -hmm. honestly, proper notice to people that you're looking at restricting parking. I think that's adequate notice for folks. Okay. Um, so you're saying that whether we include during academic year or year round, that doesn't tie us to one or the other. No, for, you're having the public hearing and right. then the TSO committee makes a recommendation to okay. the full town council. So then um, we could then move to accept the TAC recommendation uh, as our call for our public hearing and have a chance to, to do it that way. Is uh, any reason why that would not be a good idea? Okay. Um, do we need to state that more formally? Can I say I move that we accept the TSO committee accepts tax recommendation for parking on Lincoln, Sunset, and Elm Street? Um, that and just let it go with that. Or do I have should to it, or in? should it be that the uh, motion is uh, that um, we uh, that the uh, TSO committee um, wishes to notice a public hearing consistent with the TAC recommendation. I don't think we're endorsing the TAC recommendation right now, but that would gives us the ability to have that be form the basis of the. Mm -hmm. well, that sounds uh, rational to me, and I think that would be a good thing to do. Do we have a second to Andy's informal motion? Second. Second. Okay, Shalini has seconded it. Okay, um, all those in favor? Um, Anna? Aye. Andy? Aye. Shalini? Yes. And Dorothy? Yes. Okay, we have a motion that we will use the um, TAC recommendation uh, as a notice for our public hearing on parking on Lincoln, Sunset, and Elm Streets. And we will then proceed with Athena's help to um, get that hearing publicized. Um, and we'll, we don't have to set the date right now. We said after Labor Day. So we can discuss that outside of meeting. Is that right, Paul? Yes, okay. So we are then moving on to our next item. Um, and- Shalini has a hand up. Okay, yes, Shalini. Yeah, just a clarification, Paul. So you said you wanted uh, more inform like what goes into the public information piece. Do we need to decide that now? Like I'm just thinking in terms of um, like, you know, in 
the other committees where we're doing community engagement, we kind of have like a problem statement, like what is the problem we're solving for and why are we doing this? What do we want to hear from? Uh, how is it going to potentially impact people or so do we want to clarify that now or can that be discussed later? Um, so, so what the public hearing notices is does a pretty factual thing like change the parking on these streets to this way. If you want to develop more outreach material, that's something that you could certainly do. Um, we have a sort of a pretty comprehensive memo that we did last year that sort can serve as a base for that that gives a lot of background information. But however you want to do the outreach, the only thing I've heard so far, in, in addition to the legal ad that we would have to do and the posting on the town bulletin board was to flyer the cars that park there regularly after school starts. Yeah, I have a question on that. <laughs> um, uh, the, the thought of doing it every day for seven days, I saw that as a big source of, of um, paper in the streets. But um, is there any past practice about how you fly your cars? Does it have to be done seven days in a row? Because I, I just, I was a little bit startled by that. But if that if that's the practice, we'd be pleased to do it. But is there history on this? We've never done anything like that. So it's, it's what we think is reasonable. You can either, you know, it's, it's also a certain amount of how much staff do we have to do this, right? right? So mm -hmm. It takes time to do all those things if we're gonna do it with town staff. So- Okay, so town staff would do the flyering, okay. Okay, so we would work up the flyer and using other practices, right? Flyers, great. Okay, so we're a little bit over time, but we <coughs> forward. And uh, we have Guilford and we have Anna here to talk about okay. water regulations and water bylaw. And to be honest, I don't me? know where we left off. Can we say thank you and bye oh, to Tracy? Oh, Tracy, uh, thank, you. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm going to say bye. But I also just wanted to note that there are two attendees in the audience, including Jennifer Taub, who had made that original proposal. Um, and if the TSO did want to entertain any public comment on this specific parking issue before right. moving on to the rest of the meeting. That okay, can be your choice, um, but thank you. All, I want I want to thank you, Tracy. I thought that was an incredibly clear, well written memo. It was very very helpful, and um, I think that we could ask the uh, attendees in the um, audience if they. I see one hand is raised. Okay, uh, Ken Rosenthal, um, you're welcome to enter some brief public comment. Um, thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue, number 53. I want to endorse the additional suggestion that parking be uh, forbidden on one side of Sunset Avenue, east side. That happens to be my side, and I accept that as necessary. But I want to point out to you uh, and emphasize that Sunset Avenue is smaller than Lincoln. And if you do not ban parking on the other side of Sunset, what you're going to do uh, is encourage the people who can't park on Lincoln to come over and park on Sunset. And the problem there, and I think Guilford would confirm it, will be even worse because there is less parking. Now, I know you can't see that right now, except that you could these days, because there's a lot of construction work being done on the new Amherst College President's House, which is the former Lucy Benson House. And this morning, there was a long line of trucks parked all the way down past Elm Street from the, that gray President's House. And cars were having, one car had to pull into a driveway to get out of the way of another car coming down the street. So I just hope that in the public hearing that you have in September or whenever you have it, that you raise the possibility of uh, mirroring what you do on Lincoln with sunset and blocking it off on both sides of the street. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and um, okay, I see Jennifer has her hand up. Jennifer, brief comment. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to, um you know, um, affirm uh, and express my agreement with what Ken Rosenthal, um, you know, just said that uh, it, uh, since TAC has recommended, you know, uh, restricting parking on Sunset, that, um, you know, that also be part of what TSO considers in terms of restricting it um, on both sides of the street. And um, I also wanted to, um, respond to, I know at the last TSO meeting, there was the discussion of whether 
you know, again, um, parking should be restricted or not allowed on Lincoln 24 seven. And uh, I did, you know, run it by some of the residents who live on the part of the street that, you know, were um, these parking restrictions are addressing. And they said that that wasn't what they were requesting, but that if TSO, that was their recommendation and that is what they wanted to implement that that they could live with that and that would be preferable to the status quo mm -hmm. of no restrictions. So I just wanted to share that with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just in wrapping this up, I do want to say that uh, former council member uh, George Ryan uh, emailed me today. Uh, he couldn't be here for the meeting, but he can maintains his interest as he was a co-sponsor of this bill originally. And um, he is hoping that we come up with a good solution to the problem on Lincoln Avenue. Although he had wanted us to do it before UMass was back in session so that we didn't start out with the traffic hazard. But we, I let him know that we've decided we will have to do it after they're back in session. So there, there are people who are concerned about this. And Andy, I see your hand up here. Yeah, I mean, I can be real quick. We have, if we've adopted as the basis for the notice of the hearing, the recommendations of TAC, then the recommendations that cover streets additional to Lincoln become part of the right. hearing notice. Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, I think that we've covered that. And so let's go into water and sewer. Are we doing, do we say sewer? Uh, or just water? No, just water regulations and water bylaws. Yes. So Anna, why don't you start off? Awesome. All right. So first off, I want to thank Guilford and Amy for meeting with me um, last week, two weeks ago. And uh, what we were doing is kind of trying to tie up some loose ends and starting to look into the transition into sewer, because one of the things that we've talked about is that they, these need to be aligned. And so we know we all know that's coming down the pike. So that was on the brain a little bit, but more of what we were doing was tying up a couple of the loose ends that emerged in our discussion from the last meeting. So I don't know if we'll need the full, I'm gonna tentatively say, I don't know if we'll need the full hour. I'm knocking on wood right now. Um, but a couple of things that we had discussed that I wanted to make sure the group is informed of. We were talking about the um, clarity on what to do if the, uh, curb stop and curb box aren't located at the property line and kind of whose responsibility um, that would be. And what we came to the decision or what we had talked about in the meeting was that uh, if the curb is in the curb box is inside the property line, when it needs replacing, it would be moved to the property line and the town would be responsible. And after discussion with Amy and Guilford, we talked about the owner being responsible for, for, um, for paying to move it to the curb, uh, to that property line, excuse me. Um, but this only needs to be done uh, as needed to replace a section of the service line. Um, and that, and then it, if that break is on public property, hang on, I'm sorry, my notes are confusing me. So what I have is you only need to do this if the, um, when they need to, to replace a section of the service line, if the break is on the property, the owner pays to move. And then what I had was if the break is on public property, DPW pays to move. Amy, yep. did you change that to the owner would pay either way? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I mean, I think what we discussed, I mean, one of the concerns that's come up in this whole yeah. thing is like, do we, does everybody need to find out where their curbs are immediately and do work immediately and that sort of thing. And so we were trying to alleviate that concern to say like, we don't know that every single problem has to be solved immediately. We'll address these things as, issues come up in service lines. Um, so kind of take it one at a time as there's a leak or there's um, somebody doing work in, you know, in their lawn or something like that, use those opportunities to bring people into compliance on a lot of these things. Um, and I think what we had decided though was like, basically you've got the property line and anything that's within the property line is the homeowner's responsibility. You know, we've all kind of agreed to that's the homeowner's responsibility on the town side as the town's responsibility. But that does mean that if somebody's curb box happens to be in their property now, they would be responsible in the process of fixing things to bring that to the property line. Similarly, if the curb box happens to be in the, you know, not on the property line, the town would be paying to bring it to the property line because that's really where we want it 
but just kind of we each take responsibility for items that might be out of compliance on our own side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next thing we discussed was the issue, which we recognize, first off, want to recognize that this is not common. Um, the issue of what to do if the waterline crosses over someone else's private property. And what we had discussed is that the owner is responsible property line on, right? So, um, and it would, it, which is the same process that we have now, basically like that same dispute process um, is not, we wouldn't change anything in terms of how they would go about um, discussing that. It's, it's really just saying the town is responsible for these lines when they're on town property. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, the owner needs to, to manage that, um, the process. Um, and th gonna... Again, this, this is one of those things that like, there's not a ton of cases right. on the water side, but when, you know, as we're looking at applicability between the water and the sewer side, this is a little more common on the sewer side. So we think that it's good that it's consistent with both that the town is responsible in either the town, the town right of way, or if the town has an easement. And that, that's a little more common on the sewer side that the town might have an easement for a larger sewer main going in the backyards of a bunch of people. Um, but if the homeowner's line goes through their neighbor's property en route to the, the town-owned easement or public right-of-way, that they would be responsible while it's under their neighbor's property. And that's because, sewer, this is, the, this is, I know, I feel like I know 2% of this now. This is because sewers go by gravity and water does not. All right, Dorothy, what's your question? Okay, so I'm just say that I approve of a policy which says if it's on the owner's property, it is the owner's expense. If it's on town property, it is town expense. And I'm gathering that from what Amy just said, that when she says town easement, that although it is on private property, it is acting as if that it's, if a town easement means it is acting as if it is town land. Is that correct? Right. And that's um, only if there's an official easement in the deed. Right. Um, Although we can come up with a million exceptions, I think this is a good, clear program. I think that it, it makes it so less so that people think that somebody's getting a special deal. And some a couple of times it may turn out a way that somebody is not happy, but I think that this is um, a good way to do it. So I'm, I'm just supporting it, although there's a million exceptions and crazy cases you could come up with. Okay, so that's um. it. Yeah, we, Guilford, Amy and I went through the process of trying to figure out where my, my curb box was on my property, which was super fun. Um, and so I have a measuring tape. I'm ready to find it now. All right. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to skip down and then we'll get to that big transition question. So really quickly, there was one last little issue to wrap up, which was the dispute resolution timeline. Um, I went and looked at our parking ticket timeline and that's uh, 21 days from the date of issuance. So what we were, what we'd like to propose is that the, um, when they are issued a warning, when the, when the person is issued a warning or a fine, they can appeal it to D the DPW superintendent within 21 days um, of issuance. This is, that's the same as parking tickets. What I could not find is what the turnaround time allocation is on the back end, right? So how soon uh, we would be asking Guilford to re respond. So I just said consistently, everything is 21 days. It's starting to get a little bit of a long timeline because then they have a second appeal to go to Paul if they need it. Um, but I'm ha I'm I'm okay with it at this point. I'm it's it feels easy to me to have it be consistent. But I wanted to hear from Paul or Guilford, um, whoever feels equipped to or Amy to um, respond as to whether or not that's this is too long of a time because the work will all, will have been done. This is a, appealing a fine. It's not an emergency situation. So does it matter if it get up, get, sorry, I'm coming back from a long day of traveling, gets up to like 80 days, which is what we're looking at is 84 days. If they take, they take each 21, if everybody takes 21 days. Paul Guilford, any thoughts? Is there any problem that you see with that? Not from our end. Okay. Shalini? Yeah, we just got a case today, right? Where um, after the the meter water meter was changed the person's water bill went up and the concern i have about having a very long time period is that if indeed it is 
some water leakage or something at the end of the homeowner, then having those 80 days would mean that the person, like we don't know whether there's a problem in the billing or is it a... Yeah, but this isn't the appeal. This isn't the, yeah. this isn't necessarily. So like they would have had, they have to get the work done anyway because it's on their... Yeah, I know, but she doesn't think there's a problem. It's just that the water bill has gone up and the DPW thinks that the water bill has gone up because there's a leakage, but she doesn't think there's a leakage. And so no one is addressing the issues, all I'm saying. And it's not exactly what we're talking about. It's sort of, it's sort of like, I mean, how do you appeal? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say like that, that is a, that is an example where, you know, one of the ways that people can appeal is if they are requesting an abatement, which to be clear, if you're using water in your house, that's not necessarily grounds for abatement. But if you think that a meter is inaccurate and you want, you know, that, so it is an example of a, a reason that someone could appeal mm -hmm. um, a water bill. So, right. so then, so so let's let's follow Shalini's line here. Then, so this person um, emailed us today, Shalini and I today, um, saying that and I'll just if it's okay, I'll just share it. Uh, I just pulled it up. I got a letter that the town wanted to replace my water meter. I had been receiving water bills in the 150 to 250 range. The first bill after the new meter was installed was for like 750. Ooh. I'm sure there was a mistake. Uh, I went to figure out how could I how I could get this sorted out. They suggested I have a plumber come to determine where the running of water was taking place. Rather than spending money on the plumber, I decided to wait for my next bill. The next bill was $77, which makes sense because that's more in keeping with what the usage was. Um, and then there was, you know, I think this is the another point that um, Shalini raises, which is I'm sure there is an appeal process, but uh, mm -hmm. we weren't sure what it was. So this person was looking for um, advice, I think, on how to appeal. Um, so I think that that's something for us to consider making sure is very clear. But um, in this case, I think Shalini and correct me if I'm missing this, what you're saying is that we still haven't figured out what the actual problem was. And so if it were a leak, even though her most recent bill were lowered, you're saying it still would be leaking hypothetically. And so she'd still be getting more bills. Yeah, Guilford. Based on what you just told me, it's not a leak, although they probably thought it was at the beginning. To me, it sounds like her meter wasn't being read properly or reading properly and that we weren't getting a proper reading for her several cycles of the bill. So the water probably went through her house and she used it, but she might have been using it for two or three cycles or even more than that to get those bills. Um, so that's something you file for an abatement. We talk about it. Um, to tell the truth, it's really, sometimes we give people relief on it. Sometimes we don't, depending on what actually happened and we'd have to look at it more um, but if she want if she wants to talk to us she files an abatement which is on the website there's a form for that and then we we talk about it more um, we, we typically do not give abatements for people who just have houses that have old plumbing and it just leaks um, we don't want to give it's your, it's your responsibility to maintain it as it says in the new regulation um, but she may have uh, just the fact that she her billing caught up to her because she had an old meter that wasn't working right. But she just needs to file an abatement. So can you explain? I have two questions. First off, what's it, Amy? No, I was just going to say more just to clarify. Guilford and I are in the weeds on this all the time. So I think sometimes we talk in short. And um, basically, the, if I can step on my soapbox for a second, this is partly why we want people to change out their meters to the new meters because the old meters, if we're not getting accurate readings, what we do is we estimate based on past usage. And if we're estimating lower than what your actual usage is, you end up, your meter is still measuring how much water is using and it might be more than what we're estimating. And if that happens a couple cycles in a row, when we actually go to change out your meter, we realize gosh, we underestimated and you get hit with this whopper bill because of the difference between what we estimated versus what you actually used. Um, and this has happened a lot. And the more, the, the more cycles that we estimate, the more potential for deviation from what we estimate versus what you actually use. 
Um, and it sounds like that might be the case here is just the amount of water that she used for several cycles in a row when her water was being estimated was vastly different from what she was actually using. And so this catch up bill, as Guilford was calling it, can hit you pretty hard because it's a year worth of us getting it a little wrong based on, you know, just average calculations. So I want to, I want to do my very best to pull us out of the weeds because our topic is not this specific case, but is much more about the process. And one of my questions on that is, can you please define the difference between abatement and appeal? And then two, and that's my own lack of understanding from there. Um, and then second, let's zoom out on this, please. And think about is with, is our timeline a problem in this case? Um, would our timeline be a problem in this case? So those are my two questions. Um, the first is for Guilford and Amy to be a dictionary for me, please. And then the second is for everyone, which is if we use our 21 day timeline, realistically, would you need 21 days all the time as Paul, as DPW? And then two, would an 80 day potential long-term timeline be an issue? So I'll, I'll jump in. I think 80 days is fine. Um, and actually we may ask some people who file an appeal to go a little longer just to, to research some things. So I think that's fine. Um, an appeal versus an abatement. An appeal is kind of tied towards the regu um, a fine that we issued to you. Um, an abatement is when you're requesting us to change your bill. And if you read through the regulations, there's two separate, it's basically two separate sections. So you can use the same time period in both sections. I'm fine with that but they are two sort of separate things. Thank you, that's really helpful. Appeal is for fines and warnings, abatements for bills. Dorothy. Um, I'm having a problem with thinking about a defective or old water meter and how it can be trusted in one way and not trusted in another. Um, do you know what I'm saying, Guilford? I mean, if it's been giving you something wrong, how do you know it's measured the water correctly? I think you have not. a separate source. So Dorothy, I think this is why Guilford and Amy have been really pushing for us to include the radio meter transitions because the radio meters are not wrong. And so they've done a lot of sending out of education and materials with folks in their okay. bills and will continue to do so. And Guilford and Amy, do you have a rough idea of what percentage of meters have been switched over? I feel like you've told us and I forgot. I think we're at like somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of the meters have been changed over okay um, so we're we're moving through it but there's definitely still a lot more yeah at this point we're trying to target not only the ones that we're not able to get rates from but also any ones that are more than like i think before 1990 are the ones at this point that i'm trying to target to get them replaced because again over time as meters get older they lose accuracy although to be clear they lose accuracy in that they run slower so they right. run in the favor of you guys, not in the favor of us as the people that are trying to collect right, right, an accurate right. reading on the water use. Um, so it's not like we're charging you more, more than the water you're using. Until okay. it catches up to you. <laughs> Goes that way. Good. That's just how it works. They wear out and so they don't, they don't spin as much as what, you know, when water comes through because of that. Okay. So. Does that help Dorothy? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, so then the last thing about this transition, unless um, Guilford and Amy, unless I missed something here, is really we're talking through the, um, the transition period here and how to switch this over. So what we were talking through was one of the questions we had was prior to the town assuming responsibility, does the owner need to confirm the location of their curb box? We're saying, yes, we'd like to say that that's, that's what they would need to do. Um, and that includes there's so then we branch back from that right and we say then we need to make sure that we're including in their water bill some sort of step by step process. Guilford Amy and I did figure out that we can explain this in a step by step process um, for how to find that and they can um, either then at that point by their choosing pay to move it to the property line. Uh, and right that's kind of that. Um, and then the second part is if they need to make their curb box accessible and we're saying ideally, but if they choose not to do it at the time, we do have that, um, that process that I described first, when a repair is needed, they are then responsible for moving it, um, unless it's on the town land and then the town picks whoever brings it to the property line. That's that. Dorothy. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to give a, um, 
bonus or discount to any um, landowner who changed their curb box? Why would their that? meter? I mean, you were, would you, I guess I'm going back to the meters before. You want people to change the meters. If somebody changes their meter, you get $10 off your bill. I mean, um, mm, it's already free to them, though. The town pays for the meters, right? So, so it's, don't, it's, people don't want to be bothered with stuff. They don't want to read it. And they're they going to get a big it. water bill. I mean, I think that the incentive is that you're going to get accurate billing. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we necessarily need to incentivize it beyond saying this is a free service that the town offers to make sure that your water bills are accurate. Um, make sure that you're not going to get wildly fluctuating bills, um, things like that. Well, then the second issue we were talking about curb box, you were saying, um, People, the homeowner is supposed to, or the landowner is supposed to find out where their curb box, curb box is. And again, putting directions on their water bill, um, people are more apt to do that, follow through annoying steps when they feel they're very busy if there's an incentive. So I'm just throwing it out there. I, I totally hear what you're saying, Dorothy. In my mind, the huge incentive is that we are vastly changing what they're responsible for. And so there is a really big incentive here in that we aren't going to be in situations where people have to pay for repairs that are not happening on their property. So for me, that's the incentive is, is yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out where my curb box is to make sure that if I need to move it, I'm saving up the money to do that. Or I'm, you know, understanding where it is so that I know if I'm going to have to in the first place, I think what we're kind of saying is that we're going to send education out, but that the moving of the curb box isn't mandated until a repair is necessary. Um, but what we're saying is that when, if that repair is necessary, then we want to make sure that we have given the education and the information needed for people to understand how to find it and that they are responsible. Um, it's really, in my mind, it's highlighting the, the responsibility portion of this policy for people, if that makes sense. It, it, it does. It doesn't stick with my knowledge of human nature, though. Yeah, I'm struggling to think through how to how how this isn't a hu huge improvement for people in town. Um, Amy, no, I more was just going to add that, like, to be clear with that earlier conversation, nobody has to do anything until there's a problem in the line. And really, the only time when you like, if you need help finding the curb box, if you've got a problem, our guys are going to be out there and they're going to help you find it. Really, the, the crux of this conversation is if your curb box is paved over by your driveway, mm -hmm. like the town isn't the one who paved your driveway and buried your gate or, you know, put a tree right next to it that now grew over this curb box that made it inaccessible. So the, truck, the crux of it is really just that if it's inaccessible and it's something like you put a stone wall or some sort of landscaping mm -hmm. over it, then ultimately that's not on the town right. to dig that out and figure out how to make it accessible. Um, but at that point, we'd want to put it on, um, you know, the property line anyway. And hopefully you don't have personal stuff on the property line, although some people certainly do have, you know, shrubbery on on property lines and that sort of thing um but the the crux of this is really just making things accessible where the onus of who does what falls on based on where it is mm -hmm. um and and ultimately trying to get everything to the property line when there's a problem fixing fixing this these inconsistencies when there's a problem right. and need to fix them great thank you does that feel resolved for you dorothy um I think we'll wait and see what people do. <laughs> you know, that's basically it. Okay. Um, so, and, and yeah, so then the last part of that conversation was really just, we need to make sure we're including documentation on how to do that um, for people and, and how to reach, um, get support on it. So the other things that we wanted to, to think through, a um, couple minor things. We had talked about, uh, there's some, some specific buildings where, uh, buildings that are built on or within 10 feet of a property line. So now we're talking really mostly buildings downtown. Uh, state law, am I correct, Amy? It's state law requires a licensed plumber to be on site and assist. And um, we'd like to write it into our policy that the, uh, the building owner or the property owner needs to pay for that plumber because the town doesn't actually have licensed plumbers. We don't need them. Um, and so we, um, 
we would not want to be hiring uh, contract plumbers, if that's a thing. Uh, we'd want to we'd want to make sure the property owner is doing that. Um, and then the other element that we're we're going to look for here, the this is the big question, right? Which is the cost of this. So we want to know what the overall cost of this transition would be to the town. What impact would that have on water bills, right? Is this how would that be? Where are we going to get that money? Um, is is kind of the really rough way of saying that. And um, Amy and Guilford are going to look into those those numbers, I believe, for us at some point. Um, but that's and that's finances. <laughs> that's finances problem. Um, but we don't want to send them something that's a terrible idea. So I want to just at least be aware of it um, as we send this to to finance committee. Um, and then the only other thing was, you know, adding in kind of getting to what Amy just said which is that um, really making sure that there's a, there's a disclaimer in there that DPW is not responsible for what people have placed on top of a water line. So if you have beautiful landscaping on top of your water line or on top of your curb box, um, in cases where people need repairs that might damage it or might rip up part of their driveway or whatever, uh, that that is not the responsibility of the town to fix. Um, it's unfortunate and it might happen, but it's not the town's fault. Uh, Amy or Guilford, did I miss anything that we discussed? No, that was, you're perfect. Oh my gosh, step. <laughs> Perfection's a fallacy, so that's fine. Um, all right, so basically, well, one, are there any questions? And then two, just giving a preview of coming attractions. Um, I think what we're gonna do, Amy Guilford, correct me if I'm off on this because we didn't actually talk through this, is figure out how to phrase these and put them actually into the regulations. Then we get to look at that super fun document again. Yeah. Um, and then and we get to talk sewage all day long. Is that, <laughs> those are the next three steps in my mind. Okay. Um, are there any other questions about what we talked about today from TSO, my, my lovely TSO counterparts? Concerns, we feel good about these once we see them in policy language. Mm -hmm. Nothing major is going to come up that we anticipate. I think that there is a certain amount of, of uh, consistency, which is really good. Um, and uh, if people can hold the general ideas in their head in a couple of simple sentences, it makes life a lot easier when they get the details. So I, I think it's a good move. Yeah, Andy. Andy, I see your hand. Yeah, up. I just want to. Uh, make a big thank you to Anna, Amy, and Guilford for having done all of the work and presenting this to us in such a clear fashion. We really, um, I think, would have been a lot harder to have this as a discussion of the entire committee. And um, so, the three of you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All credit goes to Amy and Guilford, truly. Thank you. Um, and don't maybe don't thank us yet. We haven't even talked about sewer, so. Um, all right, great. So then I will say a huge thank you to Amy and Guilford. Uh, I'll be in touch with you about getting a timeline maybe for when you, you want to have a policy, uh, a next policy draft, and then when we should start talking sewer. All right, that was quick and painless. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Amy. Thank you, Guilford. Thank you, Anna. But Anna stays. The others can I say. turn on the TV. Okay. Um, our next issue is Shalini's engagement and outreach proposal. I'm wondering if we could quickly do the town manager appointments before that um, and approve the minutes and then get to that. Is that okay with people? Okay. Um, I don't know how efficient we are allowed to be. Uh, oh, we're not allowed to be efficient at all. I'm remembering. We have to do a motion, a formal motion on each one of these nominations. Um, so I guess we should just do that right now. Um, and um, Shalini, are you and Andy, are you feeling like doing some of the motions and spreading them out? Or are we going to make Anna do them all? Because um, we have the Cultural Council first. Um, Paul, do you need to say anything? I, I read your memos. I, no, I, I, I mean, you may be able to get away with just one motion for all three appointments. I think that would be fine. I mean, unless Athena says it otherwise, but yeah, these are pretty straightforward. There are still vacancies that we're working through. Um, uh, there's not a lot to add to these um, other than what I've written. Yeah. Okay, Athena, uh, are you able to give us some advice? Um, 
whether we can use one motion for these appointments to these three committees. I don't see why not. Okay. All right. Um, so um, I can bumble along or someone else can offer this motion. Um, Give it a shot. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. It's going to be clunky, Athena, but luckily it'll be slow. I move to recommend the town services and outreach committee recommend the town council approve the following town manager appointments right. to the cultural council for one year terms expiring June 30th, 2025. And, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, not one year terms for a three year term expiring June 30th, 2025, Cody Rooney. And for a two year term expiring June 30th, Eleanor Walsh to the historic commission for a three-year term expiring June 30th, 2025, Madeline Helmer, and to the local historic district commission for a three-year term expiring June 30th, 2025, Nicole Miller. Um, did we get um, young uh, Eleanor Walsh from Amherst College? Did we get her in there too? I did, I certainly Great. did. Thank you. But, okay. But I so. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second. Thank you. So I will call the question and I'll call uh, Shalini. How do you vote? Yes. Okay, Anna. Yes. Uh, Dorothy, yes. Andy. Yes. Okay, so we are unanimous with one absent. Um, and we have done those recommendations. And um, we also, um, can I just move that we approve the minutes of June 2, 2022 and of June 30, 2022, both regular meeting minutes? Um, Second. Okay. Um, calling the question. Um, those in favor? Uh, Andy? Yes. Uh, Dorothy? Yes. Shalini? Yes. And Anna? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we have approved the minutes. Um, we have nobody in attendees. We don't need to have public comments. So now we can turn it over to you, Shalini, to continue with your proposal. Yay. So did everyone get a chance to look at it? I can share my, I think I can. Yeah, I can share my screen if that's helpful. Um, but do you want me to go over the whole thing and then go, we can go slide by slide. I think I can do that. I can go through there are just a few slides and we can take each one mm -hmm. and see what feedback we have. Yes. I think the overall goal is that as the town service and outreach committee that we come up with uh, an outreach plan that we can then offer to the town council for other committees to have like a foundation for and of course each committee can adapt it based on their specific needs but at least it will give them some sort of a framework and i can say that we're already using this in the crc and we've received more than 55 responses to our surveys and um, for the rental registration bylaw and I think just doing it in a systematic way has really allowed us to get a at least a few different perspectives than the ones we usually hear from. So I think it's really worth us uh, at least making an effort. And over time, the hope is that people who don't speak up may feel more comfortable to speak up because we're using some technologies uh, with UMass that we are collaborating called Community Click. And that is something that allows people who attend the um, meetings, they don't have to publicly speak up, especially if it's a controversial issue and you have a different perspective. Um, sometimes people don't feel comfortable speaking, but by using some of these technologies like Community Click, we allow participants to share their comments anonymously. So just by using many, um, you know, some of these technologies using a very intentional approach to reaching the different stakeholders that we're impacting. The hope is that we'll hear from, you know, from different stakeholders and that way we're able to make better decisions. So that's kind of, so I'll just pause any questions at this point.
Shalini, I have a question. Is that? Yeah. Well, I'm Ariana. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, one question I had is, you know, we we played with Community Click during one of our district meetings, which was really cool. I'm curious if there's going to be any sort of support for, or if you're envisioning any support for counselors and how to best utilize it, because I think one of the things that was really clear was like, yes, no questions are helpful, and it like some there are some things that we're still working through, um, mm -hmm. you know, like not having it all like how to clear it and ask a new question or things like that. Um, and so I'm curious if there's going to be any sort of um, any sort of support for us in figuring out the best way mm -hmm. to deploy it and in terms of how we frame our right. questions, because it's not necessarily the same question that you can ask. Right. Uh, so right now we're just like testing it out because like in our district meeting, there were very few people and no one participated really, no one really used it. And, uh, but we, we are planning to deploy it for the rental registration and we're planning to keep, keep mm -hmm. it live. Like, so people can see the sentiments, like if people can say agree, disagree, confused, so they can click on that and there'll be a real time monitor that'll be showing people agreeing, so many people disagreeing or, so we're still, what uh, to answer your question, we're still trying it out to see what are the, clink, you know, what makes it hard for um, a counselor to use it and how to streamline it, what sort of support we, counselors may need to use such a thing. And then once we figure that out, then we'll roll out the training or something or support. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think my, my thought was like the way that it seemed to work was like, it was a full record of everything. And so if I asked, you know, do you like dogs more than cats and mm -hmm. everyone clicked agree for that. But then I said, if you like cats more than dogs and everyone clicked disagree, it would show even levels um, because it, it kept the cumulative uh, totals. And so I just was curious, um, and I know I'm getting into the weeds, so I apologize, but yeah. um, that was something I was curious about when we thought about using it to collect sentiments, like if there's a way to, to clear time it for each time. question. I think it's supposed to be time-stamped or oh, so okay. it will be based on specific questions and not. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a goal anyways. Uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. I just want to, want to briefly say that I have severe reservations about anonymous uh, programs of that sort, but. Um, do you want to share your uh, concerns? Oh, so we, we see how some um, in political groups, we've seen how they can load a meeting and people that, that if, if you don't know who they are and they're anonymous, mm -hmm. it's kind of like we, we try to protect our meetings from bombers. Um, Right. I think one reason that your constituents probably didn't use it was that they really like raising questions and being who they are, you know, and have face to face. I, I just see yeah. in our political environment, I could see how that could be misused because like a lot of stuff on the internet, a lot of social media dwells in this anonymous area. And, and so far it hasn't had good results, but um, Andy. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point you raised, Dorothy, because there's a flip side to it. I think that, uh, you know, just from my few conversations on the subject, I have had uh, residents of the town who have expressed opinions where they are, um, would be considered to be very unpopular. Mm -hmm. um, and the best example I can give is people who have serious questions about the reparations proposal. And uh, the, um, I can understand their hesitance about going public mm -hmm. in um, saying that because that gets them in this community labeled in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, but they may have very strong feelings. And I've even had some people say that they're so unhappy about the idea of um, us setting aside the amount of money that has been discussed for reparations that they don't know if they can vote for the school override. And so I think this is a serious discussion that we really do need to encourage uh, people to be able to say what's on their mind without fear of being labeled and publicly shamed for stating their opinions because they 
if they feel that way, then they obviously are feeling very strongly about it. Mm -hmm. But are they anonymous? You can have a list of names, 100 names of people attending a meeting, but you don't know who said what. But if you don't even know the names of the people who are at the meeting, you don't know what you've just heard. So, so will we, the names of the people be um, registered? So Dorothy, uh, the way it's happening is it's only people who've entered the meeting okay. that will have the link. I suppose you could get the link and not be in the meeting. That is a possibility, but we are encouraging the participants who are in the meeting to right. then sign up to this thing. So we do have, we can see who all are participating right. in the meeting. Okay. And yeah. we will also have, we are, we are keeping the questions optional, like besides mm -hmm. the name, we are keeping like maybe like we, and that's what each committee can decide what questions we want, because when they register, uh, when they sign up, sort of sign up anonymously, you, we, we can put in the questions we want, like what district are you from, or, you know, are you a renter or student or so we, it's up to us what questions we want to sort of get yeah, But you sense. just said they sign up anonymously. Yeah. I, I, I would want a list of the people, real names of the people in the meeting, not That's, linked to their opinions, but yeah, right. But um, that is, or we already know that from the, because they're entering the webinar. So you know how we see participants, we can see them. So it'll be basically the people okay, who fine. are, okay. so we can see the names. So they can, you can't pack a meeting with people from out of town or something. Yeah, like that. no, no. That's, that's important. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so where are we? I'm just trying to see what's the best way to move this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the objectives for today is like, and, and of course, feel free to add more steps to this or remove some of the steps. I'll just go through some of the steps that I looked at other communities and how they are um, utilizing community engagement. So some of the key steps were, you know, in designing and so today, hopefully we can go through the steps and see if these make sense. And then what are some key questions that the committees can ask under them and what are some channels that we have already in place, like Amherst Current, Amherst Indie, like these are channels that we have and that are underutilized right now. And so we can talk about that a little bit and it's up to you, whichever piece you want to talk, spend more time on. So in terms of the steps or the questions, you know, that we go through is like when a committee comes together with a question, maybe they can allocate 15 minutes or so to run through these questions. And so the first is to articulate what is the problem we're solving for. Um, the second question, because every problem does not need the same level of community engagement. So they can even ask, do we need this? What do we know and not know who is impacted? And what's the last one? And in, and how are we going to engage people? And then finally, what what does success look like, and how are we measuring that? Okay, so this is the first question, which we've been trying to do for rental registration. Like, what were the problems we're solving for? Like, we want better quality housing. We want more in climate. Um, we want to move towards uh, our climate action goals. And so, like whatever the problem like it's good to kind of articulate that clearly so any questions here anna do you anticipate adding a like a time kind of like a deadline like uh what are the what are the timelines for each phase of this process and, and yeah, it's so, like yeah. general advice not like obviously it depends but recommendations yeah so i think that has to be worked out with so the way i'll just use again the rental registration as an example so the chair is setting out the timeline for the whole process right like uh, we're going to on this date we're going to discuss this section and these are the people we want to engage on this date so the the chair kind of sets it up but then the committee can appoint another person so like i'm the community outreach person who's taking on the extra responsibility of making sure that we are reaching out to and coordinating the sending out of emails and so forth. So they can, so that it doesn't fall on the chair. And, and so it's the coordination between the chair and the community coordinator to figure out the timing. 
Um, okay. Okay, so, and in terms of this particular questions itself, I think some of these questions will be in the initial stages when, a, let's say we're gonna be discussing the uh, universal composting, for example. So we can have the first 15 or 20 minutes can be uh, spent every time on discussing, like what is the problem, we're, like going through the steps mm -hmm. of who do we need to engage, what are we, you know, and answering some of the questions so we can start designing a community engagement plan so that everyone in the community who's going to be impacted by it has uh, is educated about it has information about it has an avenue for sending us anonymously and publicly their comments mm -hmm. uh, which is why i think the survey has been great in rental res registration like i said we've got pretty mm -hmm. diverse points of view and not just people who are who we hear from which is also very valuable every time i Say that it doesn't mean residents and neighbors are not important it just means that we also want to hear from tenants what are the issues they are encountering we also want to hear from landlords what are the issues they are encountering so uh, yeah okay so do we need to engage the community uh, so these are just some quick questions we can go through to see like is it worth spending our time on community engagement so obviously, if it's going to increase the taxes or if it's something people have been uh, complaining about, we should definitely engage. Andy? Ah, Andy, please. Yes, I just had to get on mute. Um, now, I think that community engagement can be really important. There's lots of questions that have to be worked through I've been curious, for example, and please don't go into this from the CRC perspective, but mm -hmm. having the CRC hold the community engagement piece when student renters are not present in town mm -hmm. to, um, to give their perspective on mm -hmm. what it's like for them as renters. Mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering how that decision got made. So I think that it is really important that we consider the question of timing. Yeah. Um, I th there are other issues that I can't give come across. Um, but uh, have you know, number yeah. two is have community members voiced interest, concerns, or opposition to our project. Well, part of the problem is, is in my prior example, mm -hmm. people are afraid to state opposition. And um, are you devising a process that encourages that from people who are afraid to come forward. So those are just yeah. a couple of things that I had thought about yeah. as I looked at this. Yeah, no, I really appreciate both the questions, Andy. And so with the students thing, like for just as an example, we are starting the process now, but we're definitely like we're in touch with Tony Marulis from campus and Sally and we're working with them. So they have an off campus email that they send out. It won't be as effective, but they are already going to send it out. And our survey questions that we designed, they are like, if you are a tenant, you know, these are the questions. If you are, so right at the upfront, it gives people very specific questions that are relevant to them to invite that and to make them feel comfortable. And secondly, we're going to have a public forum again when in September, once the students come back. So right. we're just starting the process now, but we will also continue to re-engage when students are back. And definitely, I think the other advantage is like with the survey, we can see right now, for example, that 60% of the responses have been from neighbors and only like, let's say 20% are from tenants. So that means we need to reach out more to people. You know, we need to do a better job of reaching out to tenants and focus more on that. So it's like the information that we collect, it's reiterative. It's not a one and end all. So we can kind of keep improving on our engagement strategies based on the feedback that we're getting. And definitely the hope is exactly what you said, Andy, the people who are afraid to answer because of controversial, controversial questions that we create safe ways uh, like the anonymous survey or um, the community click and maybe you know we can keep coming up with new ways to make people feel comfortable yeah Dorothy yeah I was going to say that um, on the items here number one and two we are supposed to be doing these 
all the time. Uh, I thought three and four were particularly interesting because um, what pub would public participation help our public project achieve equitable outcomes? And um, you know that's something that I know you have talked about a lot. We haven't found it necessarily an easy way, but I think that that is uh, one area that we need to really work hard on. And obviously, number four, um, if there's money involved, you have to reach out to the people involved right. um, who would have to pay the increased assessment or tax increase or if there's a bond referendum. So, um, I mean, number one is, of course, basic, basic, but we are supposed to be doing that. And we have been doing that to some extent. But um, right. so I just wanted to say I really liked the, the emphasis yeah. on numbers three and four. Yeah. Yeah, and this is actually just starting questions for people in the committee. So they have a ready set of questions to stimulate a conversation. But once it gets started, like Andy brought in other angles, like is the timing right or is the, you know, is it safe for people? So that will just allow the conversation to be more, to be richer. Uh, so, and then the third step is, okay, once we agree to like, yeah, we do need to engage the community, then we also look at what do we know and not know because often there are reports and studies that have been done in the past that we kind of sometimes forget to look at. So, uh, and that's on the sponsors, I think also, the sponsors of the, um, the proposal to maybe present like, okay, this is the research that has been done or this is what other towns are doing. So just presenting all the possible information mm -hmm. there. What is the current level of, yeah. And again, like these are not the final set of questions, but again, just something to give people to think about. Okay, then who is impacted? I think this is an important question, of course, like which community members are gonna be most impacted? Who's already engaged, like we're seeing right now with residential bylaw, who's already engaged and uh, so we just had the town staff send out the email today uh, to land landlords because they again that's another group that is hesitant to respond in publicly I've, I've reached out to them and they're like people are very hesitant to come publicly mm -hmm. and speak yeah. so I think the survey anonymous survey we're starting to see some responses on that um, um, so that's good um, who can we invite to help shape and carry out the community engagement? And this is again, thinking about like um, the Gazette and having it on my slide, having it at Amos Current and India are on vacation right now, so they haven't posted anything. But many people read that, those two um, news media places. So maybe using them more and, okay. So this is just getting people to think, get creative over here. And then which town departments and committees? So is it TAC we want to go, like we've been reaching out to ECAC and it was really insightful to have them come and tell us what we could include in our inspections for the rental registration. Mm, yeah, and yeah. yeah, so just like systematically going, thinking through all of this. Okay, what questions to ask and how? Um, this again is dependent on the issue and who is being impacted um, generally, we're trying to get into questions that invite people sharing their lived experiences and not opinions as in like, do you think we should do that? It's easy to say, yeah, we should do this or we should not do that. But I think, uh, but we may be jump that we, we, oops, we tend to jump to um, solutions. Wait, let me just check my, my audio seems a little off. Um, we can hear you. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay. Okay. There was a second of feedback. I don't, I don't know why, but I is think it's still there. Yeah. Is it good? Dorothy, can you okay. try muting for a second? I'm wondering if it. Hmm. Okay. I'll keep going. Um, okay. So, what questions to ask? Um, what is the timeline for engagement? Who's the town staff and committee lead, like finalizing those things? 
and then some of the key channels and tools. And the whole goal over here was not to add the burden on the counselors too much or the town staff. And so how can we just use, uh, I mean, definitely it took me time to create a survey and manager spent some time also helping with the survey and Brianna spent a lot of time also putting, but I think what, what happened was that uh, I was able to go into engage and enter the survey questions. So then Brianna could come in and just do, so it didn't take up too much of the town staff time. Um, so I think there is a way to do this where it doesn't take up too much time, but we, and I think it's worth it. So any other channels and tools that, uh, you know, and then we also put in a question in our survey, how did you hear about it, which has been very helpful to like what's working, what's not working. So counselor emails is a big one. So whoever is sending out emails, thank you, because, um, Many people are hearing about the engaged website and the survey because of the counselor emails. Uh, the engaged website is another one. Uh, people have said they found the survey through the newspaper article that came out on Mass Live and Gazette. Um, what else? Uh, I think those are the, so far, those are the common ways we've heard people say that that's how they heard about it. And then today the town staff sent the email to the landlords because we already have a list of mm -hmm. landlords. Yeah. So then that email went out to them. Yeah, Andy? Yeah, going back one page um, from where you are right now, when you're putting the questions together, mm -hmm. I still am back on my big hang up here. And that is mm -hmm. that just um, even suggesting a question and putting wanting to put it into the list of questions mm -hmm. risks um, being criticized for having even suggested the question if it's a loaded mm -hmm. issue. And um, I think we need uh -huh. to really think through yeah. how we make it safe yeah. to have the council discussion within even committees as to what questions to include so that people are not criticized for including a question yeah. where they know that there are community members who may have that viewpoint, mm -hmm. even if they do not share the viewpoint. But, right. you know, it just seems like uh, we need to be very careful in the question and how we protect the discussion and mm -hmm and get the full set of questions that the community really wants to be able to speak on because we're getting into topics um, where community members themselves aren't going to want to raise it, but you're trying to get at questions that they may feel uncomfortable raising, but we want to make sure that they mm -hmm. feel comfortable providing their input on it. And so it's a it's a very difficult issue. I appreciate mm -hmm. you grappling with it. Yeah, no, thanks, Andy. As you were speaking, I was wondering again that having that position of a community outreach person in for each issue, and if there were counselors who had questions and felt that they are going to be, and I'm just brainstorming with you, and I'm wondering if that's a solution that they would, anyone who has a question that's potentially controversial, could send it to the community outreach person and then the community outreach person can just without naming anyone say like these are some questions we've collected from uh, from residents and from um, from counselors. And so it doesn't pinpoint any it doesn't identify any single person. I would need to think about an answer to that. I don't have one right now because yeah. I think that there might be open meeting law considerations. Right. If it's only two, like it's not going open, it's only one on one. And I think just as leaders, I think the more we can create and role model, you know, the part that it's that all questions deserve to be heard. And I know and it's just that some questions can be hurtful to the people who are being impacted. So I understand it's a very delicate balance of being having the freedom to ask because if 
many of the questions that councils have, many residents also have, and it is our job as leaders to address at least those questions. And so, yeah, Dorothy? Um, I'm getting a little lost here. Um, mm -hmm. Who is the community outreach person? Do you mean the ones that the town manager has appointed? Do no. you mean every committee has one or? Um, yes, I was suggesting that within the committee for each issue, there will be like, of course, there's a chair, but then the committee can decide like for this issue, if anyone wants to volunteer to be the key person who is going to coordinate the you know the surveys or this and that. like who's the key person for coordination between the town staff or you know just who's doing what that there'll be one rather than putting it on the chair i think this is an awful lot of of um i guess i don't really see us being able to do this for every issue. I think mm -hmm. that this is not a full time job. Mm -hmm. This is a tremendous amount of work. And I to expect that an ev that if a committee deals with four issues in a like four month period of time, that there'd be at least four counselors who would then take on an independent community engagement project. I, I don't see that as realistic at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also got confused with Andy's discussion about questions that make people feel uncomfortable. And I'm, I know he must be referring to something. I don't, I don't know what we're talking about right now. I really don't. Um, there's oh something God. that's very so sensitive that we, that we can't talk about. And so we have to do something very specially. Um, I, I need clarification. And I, I can't go beyond the example that I gave when I presented it, because I, as I pointed out, I heard from probably two or three residents that they had serious concerns about the decision to set aside the amount of money for reparations that we were talking about setting aside and uh, that they um, had various reactions to it that I thought we as a council should be sensitive to, mm -hmm. but that uh, they were afraid to come forward other than in a private conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do we make sure that on that kind of an issue that has tremendous significance for the community, that the fact that they have those opinions, but they're hesitant to bring them because they feel that they would be labeled as racist just right. for raising the questions um, so what is your it, solution to that how how i don't i don't have a solution oh. i was shalini asked for um input yeah. i was yeah. providing that now input you. that mm -hmm. there was something that we needed to think about in the process mm -hmm. i didn't have a solution because it is a difficult issue I know, and I've encountered that also, Dorothy, with respect to um, when we were, this. it's generally related to issues that are sensitive, like race, mm -hmm. and um, where we, we've had discussions in the last council, and there were many residents who had views, but none of them was willing to come and speak up because of fear of being called racist. And then I think we in this council, I faced a similar thing with the solar moratorium, that there were people who disagreed with the mm. moratorium, but were not willing to come and speak up publicly about it. So things that are controversial that might label a person as being anti, you know, being a racist or being anti climate change or being or like if you're a landlord and you are a greedy landlord, like and so anything, if you say anything, you're going to be judged in a particular way. People just don't want, they don't feel comfortable. Why would they put themselves through that? So they just don't engage. And then they're suppressing their, and so when it comes time to voting or something, then people will kind of react and we, we kind of lost that opportunity to engage them, to educate them, to listen to them. And so that's what we are working. And like you said, Dorothy, not every issue needs this level of engagement. But just like for some issues that are really important, we can go in deeper 
and there are some issues where we might just say, hey, can we just put out uh, a notice in, like even with the water by, like we've had a couple of different people come in and it was very important to them and we made a significant shift. Uh, at least I, my mind changed because I heard people who were suffering and, you know, with related to the water metering and all of that. So maybe just putting it out in Amherst Current, in the newspaper, sending it out too. So it doesn't have to be elaborate, but just letting people know that, hey, we're discussing this issue, um, I think is, is what I'm proposing. Um, I, I would like to ask Paul what he thinks about this, because I'm, I'm seeing this is mm -hmm. really tricky territory. Which, can you say which part is tricky? People who feel, I mean, we make decisions, we discuss them. And on, on every issue, there are people who feel uncomfortable with one thing or another. Mm -hmm. But we still have to have discussions and take votes and take action. And having side discuss, I don't know. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think it's so, a problem. So, um I think this is a framework for what community engagement could look like. I think Shalini said it's not for every issue. Um, one of the things that popped in my mind is what if we want to study something, you know, a new new um, you know, astronomy lab or something. It's like that's not even on the table, but we're not going to go through this whole process. So I think we need some early sort of met, um, stop points, like what does this trigger this fairly involved? And I think that there's going to be stages of it, and I think there'll be some things that are more and in, more involved, like rental registration in, impacts a lot of people. Some other things might impact fewer people. Um, so I think this is a framework that it would be really interesting to work with our CPOs on because this is right up their alley. Um, but I do say, look at it as being, there's somebody's got to do this work. So, and if it's not going to be a counselor, which is kind of a, a big ask for a counselor um, who's not really built into this. Um, mm. You've got so many other things that you're also responsible for. Who is going to be taking this on? <coughs> so I think, but I think it's important for us because we do value community engagement as a community. So we should be sort of laying out what does this look like and mm -hmm. and what's the sort of, I mean, the Lincoln Ave is a perfect example. Like that's a fair amount. It's not a huge amount, but it's a fair amount that we want to engage the community in because we want the people impact to be weighing in. Um, so I think there, we're gonna have different levels of engagement depending on what the issue mm -hmm. is. But I think having a framework for what it looks like and what it means is really valuable. Cause we don't, we sort of like, just sort of run around do different things right now. And we're kind of Dorothy already doing some of these things, but it is not coordinated. Like mm -hmm. you might have a regular newsletter and I have one, but maybe others don't. And then what you put in your newsletter and what I put in is different. But there's mm -hmm. certain issues like rental registration, which actually maybe impact your district more than mine. And so sending out that email to all counselors, hey, can you include this in your newsletters? It's just a simple ask, but then everyone is getting the same information that we put on engage it's a uniform communication that's going out to the public so i think there are many benefits to just the low-hanging fruit of let's just coordinate a little bit better mm -hmm. let's utilize the resources we already have like amos indie newspapers um our engage website and so that's just like the bare minimum we could do and even that could be um because i hear a lot of residents saying that they don't hear and they're not engaged and they don't, you know, how do they find mm -hmm. out? So this is our way of showing, no, it really matters to us what you think. Yeah, well, Paul? I, I mean, I, I also, we have to recognize not everybody wants to be engaged in local government. They yeah. just want to make sure they want to go to work, come home, yeah. have everything, you have their water working and their sewer working and kids going to school successfully and, you know, and mm -hmm. engaging it, it was just it's a hard thing. Okay. Atina has a hand up. Right. And I, I just want to say one quick thing. I mm -hmm. see for me at this moment, the primary importance of this is I think that they're really excellent questions to be asked in the committee, in our own committee work, in our town council work. And it kind of, it's a great checklist of the things we need to think about as we talk. So I've got absolutely, I, I really like that. Um, Athena. Thank you. I just wanted to add, um, 
I, I've been thinking about what Andy said about these sensitive issues and and wondering where or if the the one on one interactions that counselors have with their constituents are are considered a community engagement, then they should be maybe mentioned as part of this process so mm -hmm. that we can acknowledge that some of those conversations do happen one on one and that can be considered part of the process and counselors can speak to what their constituents are telling them during meetings and um, and recognize that some of this engagement doesn't happen during meetings. And through emails, I mean, you know, we get in my district, we get a lot of emails. We're in constant conversation, a large group of people. Yeah, thank um, you, Tina. Yeah, that's really important. Well, I, I, I just wanted to thank Shalini because I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep my little copy um, out with my TSO meeting papers. Um, <laughs> And remember to go check through and see, did we check that? Did we ask that? Uh, I think that's a really important thing to do. Um, and I'll make it like a checklist. This was more like a presentation. I think I can make it into like a checklist that we can have, and then we can just kind of see which are the questions relevant and just say not applicable for this particular issue. And that might be easy to do then. So I would like to say it is uh, okay. 8.15. And um, I will open the floor to anybody who may want to say something at this time. Otherwise, I would like to thank uh, Anna and Shalini for leading really great discussions um, and um, to adjourn. Oh, I do see one other member. Uh, no, what am I? I see Jim oh. Barnett with his hand up under panelists, no, under attendees. Mm -hmm. uh, should we? Um, that would be public comment, I'm guessing, Dorothy. Right. Okay. So let us invite him in for public comment or her. Okay. How do you do? Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm Jim Barna, and um, I live at 34 uh, Dana Place. Um, regrettably, I, I uh, haven't seen uh, much of the meeting until now, but I just wanted to uh, talk about the issue of parking on Lincoln Avenue. Right. Uh, May. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk on behalf of the people who actually park um, and work and live in the community. And, um, you know, I don't think they have much of a voice. And uh, if we exclude parking once again to the peak from the people, who actually use the parking, who are actually thriving and studying and working in this community. We just further the exclusion uh, and the bipolarity of this community. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there is no distinction between the University of Massachusetts and the town. And you know the people who work at UMass and study at UMass those are your constituents. Those are the citizens. Those are the people that utilize uh, the town of Amherst, pay your sales tax and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's important that we give those people who are utilizing a public good, which is parking, the opportunity to continue to do so. Um, I walk up and down that road twice a day, every day, and I don't see the, you know, parade of horribles that the owners of the properties on that street see. What I see is a lot of people utilizing a public good and doing the best they can. Um, well, let's not forget that is a very wide street. Um, and that is a street that is a natural access point for, for UMass Amherst. If we exclude parking during the day there, the, the speed of traffic will go up, not down. Um, the way it's used now is actually, in my opinion, pretty good. If we exclude parking there, they're gonna go right over to sunset. Um, I just think that uh, you know, certainly there are improvements that can be made, but to make it a rule where during the week, during the day, no one gets to park there uh, really sends the wrong message um, to, to, to the people of Amherst regarding who's important in this town. 
Are we all important or are only certain property owners important? Um, thank thank you, so you. Thank you for your comments. I would suggest that you um, watch the um, tape of this meeting because we gave a very detailed uh, discussion with input from DPW uh, to do with the safety, the width of the road. And there will be a public forum um, after Labor Day in which uh, people will be invited to um, respond on this issue. But I think you'll find a lot of information in the, the um, what do we call it? The, the videotape of this meeting, um, which- Well, I would uh, encourage, uh, I would encourage the members to not just take what DPW says. They they only care uh, about what uh, what uh, Mr. Brockelman has told them to do, and he cares particularly for the property owners of this community. Um, look at the safety records. Look at how often, not on the corner of Lincoln Avenue uh, at Amity. Um, Sure, there were problems there, but look at the safety issues up and down Lincoln. You'll find they're almost non-existent. Okay, we can't debate this now, but thank you for your comment. Thank you. Um, do we have any other um, comments at this time? Um, then uh, I would say let's be adjourned. Oh, Great. Shalini, I didn't see your hand. Thank you. Yeah. Just a question about the community engagement. Like, what are the next steps for that? the plan that's proposed. Do we want to like sleep over it and then have a, another discussion? Because my goal was, or hope is that we can then mm -hmm. finalize something and then propose it to town council. Um, I suggest we discuss it, and I'm, I'm looking at Paul right now, that we discuss it uh, briefly at a future meeting. Um, I think that the question of who, who does it and how it is done and how much of it is done uh, the practicalities is something that maybe we want to think about a little bit. Um, certainly, we can do what I mentioned, which is to use it as a structure for our own discussions. But you are talking about a step beyond that. You are talking about having more outreach into the community than some committees are doing. So, um, Anna, do you have a comment on this? I do. Um, Shalini, do you think it'd be possible for you to write this up as an actual, as a the, the presentation was great, but if you write it up as an actual mm -hmm. action plan with the checklist and the timelines, or like you, as much mm -hmm. as you know, yeah, absolutely. and then you talk through that as something to pitch, that that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. I actually have a 15 page, but I'll try to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. And with resources that I'd give links to, you yeah. know, where I drew all this information from. And then, yeah, and that will be something that we can then. Yeah, like okay. if there was I'll a step by step it. guide, we could, yeah. Gotcha. And okay. I'd like to offer up the CPOs as a resource to review that with before you bring it back to this committee. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Appreciate Very that good all. idea. So that, that's really what I was looking for was a, a mm -hmm. way of trying to integrate it into other structures that we already have and to yeah. see what we might need more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, your hand down, Shalini, or you still have anything? To okay, great. So everybody, thank you for a good, good day's work and see you next time. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.